Welcome to the April Progressive Forum on Platform Capitalism with Nick Cernick. I'm Tae Han Song, and I'm MC here in Seoul, Korea. Now, without further ado, I'll pass it on to Norbert, who will be interviewing Nick Cernick. Greetings, everyone. And hello, hello Nick. Uh, How are you feeling today, Nick? You're okay? Yeah, I'm good. Good. I'm looking forward to this. Today, we have Nick Cernick author of Platform Capitalism, the book we read, and a lecturer at King's College London. Just to give you a brief background, the ISC had a book club around the Platform Capitalism book to understand the recent phenomena of the tech companies within a political economic context. One of the things I appreciated about your book is that it provides the historical trajectory that brought us to today's Platform Capitalism. In particular, you stated that the 70s saw a shift towards lean production models and precarious work due to increased competition in manufacturing. The 90s saw the dot-com boom and bust that laid today's technological infrastructure and loose monetary policy. With the post-08 financial crisis continuing this loose monetary policy. Up to recently, uh, governments focused on austerity on the one hand and asset price Keynesianism quote unquote, on the other, to create wealth through stock bubbles, especially that of platform companies. So the first question, what made this asset price Keynesianism the preferred method of funding recovery after economic crises? Go ahead, Nick. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good question. Um, it's part of the long rise of neoliberalism, um, and particularly the increasing dominance of the financial sector over the manufacturing sector, which had dominated in the post-war period. Uh, so you have this dominance of the finance sector over manufacturing, um, and they start to shape policymaking and government actions. Uh, so there's efforts to keep stock prices and other financialized assets rising, um, all of this to keep the financial sector happy. And that was often at the expense of competitiveness, particularly global competitiveness of manufacturing. So there's been consistent fear mongering over government deficits throughout the neoliberal period. Uh, and this has led to governments preferring other options um, rather than spending money. Uh, this is particularly the case after 2008. Uh, the US, the UK, and especially the EU, they all united in a consensus about using monetary policy to respond to the crisis instead of fiscal policy. Despite many economists basically saying what was needed was you know, active fiscal policy. Okay, thanks for that, Nick. Uh, next question. So what are its long-term impacts on the economy? Um, so basically, uh, it's fueled speculative bubbles has been the major impact of this, this approach to um, uh, you know, government intervention in the economy. So you have the dot-com bubble of the 1990s, then you have the housing bubble of the 2000s, and then I would argue you have a startup bubble of the 2010s. So this uh, 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 this effort at monetary policy, this effort at ch um, bringing about cheap money through low interest rates, through things like quantitative easing, it's meant a surplus of capital, which has been seeking to find a decent return on investment. So you can't just part these things in government bonds. You have to actively go out and search more risky ventures, um, which has fueled these bubbles. I think there is an open question now about how many of the advanced economies are actually dependent and reliant upon uh, this easy monetary policy. So Lauren Summers, for instance, has this notion of secular stagnation, uh, which basically argues that the advanced economies have been in a period of slowing growth, near zero growth at points. Um, and the only way in which the rich economies have been growing for decades has been through this active monetary policy, which has kept things artificially cheap, kept, uh, kept money artificially cheap. So the option seems to be either we accept secular stagnation and you know, the, the, the almost zero growth that comes with it, or we accept the repeated inflation of asset bubbles. Um, and that seems to be the situation that a lot of advanced economies are in right now. Cool, thank you, Nick. Recently, the Fed increased interest rates to stave off inflation. And furthermore, US President Biden appears to be trying to onshore manufacturing. How do both of these trends affect the future of asset price Keynesianism, quote unquote, again? Yeah, so I think it's a potentially momentous change 
Uh, so it's this move in America to higher interest rates into much more active fiscal interventions through things like the uh, the IRA um, and you know chip subsidies and all these sorts of things, things which haven't been really you know all that significant in U.S. policy for at least thirty years. So it reverses this asset price Keynesianism from the focus on monetary policy to a new focus on fiscal policy as a response to economic challenges. That could be a really big change. Um, on the issue of reshoring, I don't think it's going to change all that much uh, because the way in which manufacturing is coming back to America and coming back to uh, you know, the rich world, um, it's only coming back in a highly automated form that tends to benefit the owners of capital rather than having any benefits broadly. Crucially also, it doesn't increase their power uh, with respect to finance. So you still have the importance of finance capital and I would say platform capital as well um, versus manufacturing capital. Uh, now, I think there's still open questions about how successful the new US approach is going to be in terms of generating growth, uh, especially in the medium term. There might be some short term stimulus that we see, but will this be sustainable in the medium term? It's unclear. So it might be that in three to five years time, we see central banks slashing interest rates again in an effort to get growth going. Uh, I think in a country like the UK, it's very likely. I think that's really the only option that the UK has. Um, it's pretty dire here. Thank you very much, Nick. Okay. For a while, there seemed to be a great deal of optimism about the possibilities of the blockchain to decentralize platforms such as Airbnb and distribute profits and benefits to the user. What are the potential and or limitations of this blockchain technology? Yeah, so I think um, many new technologies, blockchain being only one of the latest, um, many new technologies tend to emerge on the back of a wave of hype. Uh, and this is partly, um, uh, partly responsible for their eventual success is you need to have this sort of moment of financialized hype where the investment is laid down for the future success of a technology. The internet is, I think, a really good example of that. Um, the challenge, though, for anybody who wants to actually analyze these things and think about them critically, is not simply to denounce it all, but actually to separate out the hype from the substance behind all of the hype. Um, now, with blockchain, much of the popular attention and the media attention uh, has been on the financialized hype side of the technology. And I think there's obviously a load of issues with this side of blockchain, uh, most notably energy consumption of something like Bitcoin. Uh, the huge risk of scams, you know, so many people swindled out of money. Um, even in successful cases, interesting cases, it's really difficult for the average person to actually go and use these things. I don't know if you've ever tried to trade crypto, but it is an absolute maze to try and do. Um, and then you also have these quite ridiculous use cases, which are just created to scam people out of money. Things like NFTs, I think, are a really good example of it. <laughs> um, so there's all these obvious issues with blockchain. You know, there's a number of people who have been quietly working on blockchain technologies as a decentralized alternative to these centralized digital systems. I think this stuff gets a lot less media attention, um, in part because it's still a lot of it hasn't come to fruition yet. Um, but I think there can be real benefits once these um, technologies are developed. And particularly once they're separated from a sort of libertarian phobia of trust. You know, this is what drives uh, the proof of work behind Bitcoin. Um, it's what, you know, ends to a lot of the, um, uh, the problems with existing blockchain technology. So I think once you get past this libertarian um, phobia of trust, systems can be made much more energy efficient. So you don't have to have proof of work like you do with Bitcoin, you could have proof of stake. Um, that relies upon trusting people, which I'm sure all of us are fine with. Um, but you can also have systems which are oriented towards creating public goods, say open protocols, open software, even you know open hardware, rather than a focus on individualized gambling and trying to make money um, in an individual way. Right, right. Question three, my friend. So platform capitalism was written in 2016, yet much of its analysis founded upon the basic driving forces in a market remains very much relevant in understanding our current reality. Great book, really. If you were to put an updated edition of this book, please, please do that. 
what would you add or change in particular after part one, the boost that platforms, especially delivery and online shopping got during the pandemic? Uh, I am trying to write a sequel at the moment. Um, so better than an updated version, um, a whole book on, on artificial intelligence and what it means um, for the digital economy. Um, so yeah, to, to return to your question, I think, yeah, like you say, the biggest change during the pandemic was the rapid adoption of platforms and the growing reliance on them. So not just individuals, but also businesses all moved online. Uh, it meant a big boost for e-commerce and delivery services, most obviously. Now, perhaps lesser known, though, is the growth of cloud computing during the pandemic. Uh, so consumers made much more use of online entertainment during the pandemic. Streaming services saw a boom. Video games became an even more popular pastime. Uh, and with companies moving online, both for remote work and for general IT purposes, cloud computing also grew in demand as a result of that. Uh, real, is, is, is Amazon the biggest cloud service? Yeah, I, it, it is the biggest. I think they just released their quarterly statement where they made something like $80 billion in revenue. Um, it's massive, absolutely massive, bigger than their e-commerce. So Amazon isn't an e-commerce company. They're a cloud company, first and foremost. So we know of these obvious beneficiaries of the pandemic. So companies like Zoom that we're using, uh, Peloton, Netflix, Disney+, Plus, Fortnite, if you go and actually look at where these companies, uh, where their services exist, they live on Amazon servers. They live on Amazon's cloud um, service. Uh, so cloud computing from the big three, which is Amazon, Microsoft, and Google, has been foundational for much of the pandemic. Um, but there's also been new opportunities for these companies, these cloud companies to expand, particularly into areas where they haven't had much of a presence before. So this was especially in industries that have been highly regulated for one reason or another. I'm thinking in particular of healthcare and education. And over the course of the pandemic, uh, there was massive interventions by the cloud companies into these two sectors. Uh, so the pandemic has meant both a growing intensity of reliance on platforms, particularly these cloud computing companies, uh, but also a growing expansion of their power and their, their influence into new areas as well. Okay, thank you, Nick. And now for the future, uh, in platform capitalism, you mentioned that the expansion and the extraction of data from platform users is a fundamental driving force of platform capitalism. In other words, Facebook doesn't violate your privacy because of Zuckerberg, but because of capitalism. And you also mentioned that one of the trends is towards the fragmentation of the internet into separate ecosystems. For example, Facebook's metaverse would take up one part of the internet, please God no separate from, say, Google's realm of the internet. And so what impact will recent breakthroughs in AI, such as ChatGPT, have on these two tendencies? So I think data is still crucially important um, for the platform economy. But you have the situation where the upper echelons of the platform economy are reaching a stage where all of these companies have immense and competitive quantities of data. Um, so you can look at, for instance, uh, recent AI training, whether it be from Microsoft, whether it be from Google, whether it be from um, you know, any other company, it's a huge amount of data which is being thrown into these models. So I think AI certainly drives the search for more data. Um, and one of the key principles that been, has been found in research and in, in practice in recent years is that more data makes better AI models. And that's particularly when it comes to the new generative AI models. Uh, so we see increasingly large data sets being thrown into these systems. Now, at the same time, to train AI requires immense amounts of computing power. Uh, so it's not just a matter of data, it's also this hardware aspect. So GPT-4, for instance, is said to have cost more than $100 million to build. Uh, and a vast amount of that is because of the computing hardware that's been necessary for it. Between 2012 and 2019, there was a 300,000 times increase in the amount of computing power needed to train the largest models, uh, which is a doubling of the computing power needed every 3.4 months. Uh, so all of this has made ownership of and access to computing power increasingly important. Uh, and I think it's cloud computing uh, companies which are positioned to be able to benefit from this 
reliance upon hardware. Um, so the shift to cloud computing is an expression of this change. It's data center scale computing that's required to do AI today. Uh, and GPUs that you own at one point, uh, well, GPUs that you own, they can be used at one point to further your own company's research and then be used at another point as a rental for a small AI startup or even, um, even you know, uh, another major competitor. Uh, so computing resources are in turn an expression of financial resources. Data centers cost tens or hundreds of millions of dollars, and all of this is only available to the top tier technology companies. So their control and ownership over hardware, not just data, but hardware, uh, means they're therefore capable of setting the terms of access and development of AI and the future of the digital economy. So a huge amount of power is being concentrated in their hands, and I think this focus on hardware um, is one of the big shifts I've made in my own thinking since platform capitalism. All right, next, Nick. In the book, you state that overcoming the tendencies towards a monopoly of these platforms is impossible within a capitalist framework, possibly implying the need for platform socialism. In particular, you mention the potential of governments to harness their vast resources to create platforms that serve the public good. Do you have any examples of such platforms? And if not, what might they look like? It's surprisingly difficult to find examples. Um, I think one of the best examples, though, is uh, a, a delivery, uh, sorry, not delivery, uh, uh, sort of a ride sharing platform called Ride Austin, so yes. based out of Austin, Texas. Yes. Um, and it's interesting because it's, it's an Uber competitor. And effectively, what happened was Uber and Lyft, the major companies, were forced out of the city after they failed to meet local regulations. And this left a, a sort of a, a hole in the ride sharing platform business. Um, and what happened in that city was that there was a number of nonprofits which rose up to replace the old companies. So one of the nice things about Ride Austin was they also made completely public the process of doing this. So you can go and find information on exactly what they did and how they did it. They built an app in four weeks with only six people. Uh, they aimed to have a fast rollout, so they got a product out to the market as soon as possible, and then they constantly update it. So within eight months, they had something like um, 60 releases of all the different versions uh, of the software. Now, in terms of financing this, they simply used donations from the local tech community. Uh, so it wasn't like some billionaire came along and gave them a ton of cash. They could just get community funding. Uh, they used third-party services, so... Amazon, again, uh, but also services for payments and things like that. Uh, and these costs tended to decrease uh, in price as the app grew larger, but other costs did go up. So dealing with fraud um, as it became a bigger target, things like that started to increase in their costs. Now, the benefits of this approach um, was that they managed to provide a cheap service. Uh, so it was pretty competitive with Uber and Lyft, but they also paid workers much better than what Uber and Lyft were paying. They also donated money to local charities, so the money stayed within the local economy rather than being siphoned off to Silicon Valley. Now, the challenge for Ride Austin was that Uber and Lyft were eventually let back in the city, so Uber and Lyft lobbied state regulators to change laws to get back into the city. Now, as a result, the use of these, um, uh, these nonprofit apps took a significant hit. Um, so one basically immediately dropped out, another saw a 20% decrease, uh, and another app saw a 50% decrease in one week. Basically, Uber and Lyft came and used their venture capital funding to immensely subsidize the costs. Um, so really cheap rides, um, and they sort of temporarily jacked up the wages for drivers as well. So Ride Austin ended up getting uh, driven out of business by these large companies. Okay, and my final part of this question, my last question here, uh, what prevents the creation of municipally run versions of platforms like Airbnb all over the world? Yeah, I think it's a really important question. Um, I think the biggest one is simply a lack of imagination and ambition by governments at whatever level, municipal, regional, national, whatever. Um, there's this sort of belief that what Silicon Valley does can't be replicated by a government. Um, and the idea that you could simply build a platform seems absurd to a lot of politicians. Like, go and build an Uber? No, that would be too difficult. Um, the, the thing I love about Ride Austin is that it shows that it's entirely possible. 
six people in four months with community funding did it. Why could London not do it? Why could New York not do it? Why could Berlin not do it? You know, um, it's entirely possible. Um, but the other reason why I think we don't see it is that there's a lack of political strength to take on these platform monopolies and these large companies. So Ride Austin shows the challenges that face these alternatives. Um, if, if they have to compete with these massive companies, which are subsidized um, in the billions uh, by venture capital, they stand no chance. There's no way that a locally funded alternative is going to succeed against a billion dollar company. So if a government really wants to build an alternative, they also need to put significant restrictions on the large platforms. And I don't think most governments are willing to do that. Okay. And Nick, uh, and for, that concludes the interview portion with, with your buddy Norbert. I'm going to pass it off to Dehan now. For ISC, this is Norbert Morvan. Uh, thank you, Nick and Norbert. Um, what a great opportunity uh, for those of us here in Korea and around the world uh, to, yeah, to more deeply understand platform capitalism, uh, which so defines our time. Yeah, and thank you so much for all the great insights uh, that span technology and political economy. Thank you very much uh, for having me and for all the great questions as well.